Yeah, I, I read four books. Hello and welcome back to Bookish and welcome to kind of a wrap up, I guess, a weekly reads video maybe, in which I'm just going to talk real quickly about the four books that I finished. I guess this week or maybe since I posted my video with the Emily Henry uh, connection um, a couple of weeks ago, I guess. Um, but I wanted to post this video just to kind of keep track of where I am in reading and the reading events that are going on on BookTube and also as a way for me to remember uh, what I've read and what I plan to read. So like, I, like the video says, I've read four books uh, essentially this week. The first of those was Held by Anne Michaels. This is a book that's nominated for the Booker Prize. I suspect it'll be the last Booker Prize book I read before the announcement of the shortlist is made. I have a hold uh, on at my library for uh, the safe keep, but it doesn't show any signs of coming in the next couple of days. Uh, but I did read Held by Ann Michaels, and I think this is the book on the Booker Prize list that seems to be the most divisive. It seems like people either love it or they hate it. I think people call that a Marmite book uh, sometimes. Um, but I, I'm one of those who would say that I, I, I really liked it. I thought the book was really good. If you don't know, in the you know, I read this book uh, as an ebook uh, that I got, or I read this book from the library. I checked from the library. I've already had to return it. Um, so in this book, Michaels begins with a soldier, a World War One soldier who we figure out has been wounded, and he's laying all along the banks of a river or near the banks of a river, essentially waiting to either die or to be rescued. And he then is rescued, and the story kind of kicks in, the story such as it is. I've seen people describe this as a loose kind of set of uh, related um, short stories that are tied together. I think it's a little bit more than that. Because what really happens is it's not necessarily just the story of that one soldier uh, and his life before and after the war, even though uh, we get information about that. It's really a story or really a novel about, I think, time, uh, and legacy and what we leave to leave to, to other people, how we pass on our legacy, our ideas, uh, the energy of what we do, uh, you know, the role that art plays um, in uh, perhaps passing on legacy, the role that things like photography and writing play. And it really is, I think, more of a meditation about, you know, legacy and life and death and how we connect to people in their and you know from our past generations in our future. Because really what it tells is a series of kind of vignettes and stories about people who are all in some way connected to that first soldier, whether it's his wife, his daughter, um, you know, uh, granddaughter. There are all kinds of people who are involved in the story at all kinds of levels. There's all kinds of things uh, in the story that seemed to be a little bit mystical, including, you know, uh, things appearing in photographs that probably shouldn't be there, uh, people who uh, live lives very similar to the lives of people in previous generations. And there's a lot of, I think, thinking about love and relationships and grief and death and time uh, and all those things. There are all kinds of connections, I think, and little markers that are woven uh, or references that are woven throughout uh, the various stories. And if you pay attention, I think it makes it a much more, a much richer reading experience. Is it a book that's heavy on plot, you know, beginning with a beginning and an end? No, it's not. And I think that's intentional because I think what Michaels might be exploring here is the idea that uh, life doesn't necessarily end in that way. And even though time may seem to go in one direction, which I think is why so many of the first chapters are connected to rivers, it actually becomes more fragmented. You know, I think she's references or is kind of playing with the idea, um, you know, about light and, and, and relating that to life. You know, is it uh, a wave? Is it particles? And I think we look at the individual characters of particles and then we look at them collectively. They're like a wave uh, of kind of things happening and interrelated things. Anyway, I may have gone way off the beam on, on uh, describing what the book's about, but um, uh, I think that those are things you should be looking out for. And if you read and you haven't read it yet, you can look out for those things and say, those aren't there, you just made all that up. That's fine because it, it's that kind of book. And I like that kind of book. If you are a really plot-driven reader, I don't think this is a book that is gonna be good for you. If you're a person who likes to attach themselves to characters, uh, and follow those characters throughout a book. 
this is the book for you. Uh, and so I understand why it has that kind of Marmite effect, that kind of divisive effect on people. You know, of the, of the Booker Prize books I've read, and I think I've read six or seven, this would be probably my solid number three uh, behind James uh, and Wandering Stars. So that book also, by the way, qualifies for Shorty September because it's right around 200 pages. The second book I read definitely qualifies for Shorty September, and that's Home by Toni Morrison. Uh, this is one of her later books, one of her last books, I believe. I think that I think Bless the Child is the last novel uh, that she published, but I could be wrong about that. And this book uh, is, I think, really subtly and kind of brilliantly tells a story about a man named Frank Money. He's a veteran of the Korean War. He has been uh, scarred by his experiences during that war. Uh, and he comes home to an America where racism and racist violence still exists. We learn about his childhood. We learn about his very close connection with his sister, uh, the trouble that they had growing up in their family, uh, and you know all kinds of issues related to that. And, and Frank Money is, a, is, I think, an interesting character. But in telling the story of Frank Money return from war, an eventual return back home uh, for you know tragic reasons. She's also, I think, doing a great job of weaving in the almost casual horrific violence that oftentimes uh, attended racism. There is, uh, you know, part of the story, and one of the themes that goes throughout the story is these horrific acts of racist violence, which take place. Um, and, you know, being Morrison, you're not hammered over the head with these things. They are a part of a story that is in and of itself uh, compelling. And I thought it was really good. Is it, you know, the best Toni Morrison I've ever read? No, but it's pretty direct. It's pretty uh, simple in its construction and in its prose, I think, and in its ideas. Uh, and, of course, it's beautifully written because that's what Toni Morrison does. Uh, the third book I read this month is Alice by the Fire by Jan Foss. Um, this is, uh, you know... I'm a great admirer of Foss's uh, Septology, and this is a book uh, written in that same style, which I think is referred to as slow writing, which involves a tremendous amount of repetition. Uh, and as such, it's kind of repetition in thoughts. We're always in characters' heads. We're always kind of seeing what they think and seeing what they see in their mind's eye. Uh, and they take repetitive actions, but every time an action is repeated, a new layer of meaning or a new layer of something is added to it. And it is incredibly, um, in, you know, an interior book about characters. We shift from point of view from one character to another. We are grounded uh, in an old house in which our two main characters, I'm going to call them that, live uh, by a fjord, which, you know, should sound familiar to those of you who've read uh, the Septology. Characters have uh, the same names, if not the exact same names sometimes. Uh, and it, I think, kind of like hell, it explores connections over time, because it's not just these two people. It's the two, three, four generations of uh, Allah's family who have uh, lived uh, in this house before and how their stories kind of all blend together, almost as though their energy is trapped there, uh, almost as though their spirits are trapped there and there's interaction across these generational lines. I thought it was beautiful. I thought it was very good. I can see where it's not going to be everybody's taste and I think that's true uh, for Fossa in general. This book is not as, I don't think the writing here is as emotionally powerful as it is in uh, the Septology. Uh, I think the style is the same, but I think in Septology, Fossa hit on a theme uh, which really focuses more on grief. This one focuses a little bit more on loss, uh, and there is a difference between those two things. And so I, I didn't find it to be quite as moving, but that style of writing, this style of book, just really works for me. It is really short. If you are thinking, uh, you know, you want to read uh, Jan Foss and get an idea of how he writes and how his writing works, this book, which by the way, this is the copy I bought in Iceland. Uh, this book is right at 74 pages long in the, in the Fitzcarraldo edition. Uh, and so I really, really liked it. Um, not quite as much shiptology of it, but I just thought it was great. And then the fourth book I read, which I just finished, is a book that qualifies for Framed in September, another one of the great September reading events. This is by Percival Everett, and this is the story of a painter named Kevin Pace, who, um, and I think this is kind of true of almost all of uh, Everett's uh, main characters, except probably in James. 
that they seem to know a lot of the same things and seem to do a lot of the same things that Everett does. If you don't know Percival Everett is a painter, he had been a horse trainer, he's a musician, he's obviously a writer, he's a college professor, and if you think back, if you've, if you've read a lot of, um, of Everett's books, you kind of see these elements of Everett, I think, in these characters. Not that any of them are autobiographical, and certainly not that any of these stories are autobiographical, but for instance, in Telephone, the main character is a college professor. Uh, in Erasure, the main character is a writer who, you know, gets published, but is not particularly, uh, you know, financially successful in terms of selling lots of books. He's respected, but not uh, making a lot of money. And here in um, in uh, So Much Blue, we, we have a painter who is very successful as a painter. And this story takes place on along three timelines. The one I'm going to call the present is signified by the chapters that are called Home, uh, which takes place, you know, in a world in which there are cell phones and things like that. And our painter, Kevin Pace, is working on a, a large canvas, which he is keeping secret from everyone. He is obsessed with keeping this canvas secret. Uh, from his wife, from his friends, doesn't allow anybody to see it. And, you know, he has this whole plan to destroy it uh, when he dies. And so that's one timeline. And we see the trouble uh, that uh, Pace's uh, flaws as a person and the trauma he's experienced inflict on or caused to his family. In the second timeline, it's set in Paris about 10 years before, uh, in which, you know, Kevin Pace faces some kind of uh, moral crisis, and I won't give away what that what happens there. And then the third uh, timeline is set in uh, El Salvador in 1979, right on the eve of civil war in that country, uh, in which Kevin Pace accompanies his friend Richard uh, to El Salvador to look for someone who's very important to them. And they have adventures and they experience things that are going to affect them for the rest of their lives and then affect the rest of the story. Um, this book to me, of all of Everett's books, this one is the most like Telephone in that we have our main character who is kind of an academic and yet uh, is involved in something uh, dangerous and something that requires him to perhaps behave heroically um, in ways. And so it's mo most like that. And then we have the same character. We see his problems with his marriage, his temptations and things like that, and how that affects his family uh, and his marriage. It is, a, it is a real, I think, deep look at this character, uh, an examination of it. And one of the things I like about Percival Everett is he is not afraid to have you dislike his main characters. They, they are oftentimes uh, deeply flawed people. Um, and I think there's something brave about that. Um, you know, and to a certain extent, James has fewer flaws than most of his uh, main characters do. But that that's true in So Much Blue. I enjoyed the book. I thought it was good. I'm not sure that I buy the character being able to pull off all the three different parts of the story uh, that we're presented with. So it's not my favorite uh, Percival Everett. Uh, it might be my least favorite Percival Everett novel, but that saying, uh, that means it's still really, really good. The man is a good writer, can tell a good story, uh, can get you involved in the characters uh, and make them memorable. And that's true for So Much Blue. So those are the four books that I read this month. It's still Shorty September, so I still have a lot of books on my Shorty September uh, uh, TBR, Pile of Possibilities. I did start Permafrost by Ava Baltasar today. Uh, you know, I loved Mammoth, and you know I love Boulder. I still have to get to Books and Islands in Ojibwe Country by Louise Erdrich, a book of essays. I still have, and this is maybe the shorty book I'm most likely to not get to, uh, The Cellars of the Majestic, uh, which is a Maigret uh, novel, I believe, by Georges Simenon. Uh, and then I'll have another personal ever book, Watershed, which I have no almost nothing about, which also comes in right around 200 pages, so it qualifies for Shorty September. And then when I started off my pile of possibilities for the month, I forgot to mention that I'm going back to reading Bad Hemingway, uh, and so I'm going to be reading uh, The Garden of Eden, uh, one of the... Uh, Another one of the posthumously published um, Hemingway novels, which uh, I will get to uh, soon. Uh, and my memories, I haven't read it the first time. It's a quick and interesting read. That's how I'll put it. And I'll, I'll do a review of those because I've reviewed all the other bad Hemingway books that I've been reading uh, recently. Anyway, there you go. If you have any thoughts about these books, anything else you'd like to say or talk about, please leave those comments in the comment section down below. And as always, thank you for watching.